Hey everyone, Todd Lovell from the Vine of Northwest Arkansas. Merry Christmas to you, to your family, to your friends. I hope you had a wonderful weekend uh, celebrating together. Uh, welcome once again to my living room for our last week of our Christmas Isn't Canceled series. Uh, I'm so glad that you are joining us uh, this evening and thank you so much for allowing me into your living room. I know that is, that is such a big ask and so, um, Thank you for allowing me into your space, wherever you're watching, maybe it's in your living room, maybe it's in your car, wherever you are, thank you so much for allowing uh, us to have this time together. Just a few housekeeping things before we get started. First of all, one of, uh, one of the most important things that we're doing right now is working on our digital presence. So there's not a lot that we can do in person right now because of COVID. So one of the ways that you can help us out as a new faith community is that you can like our Facebook page. Liking our, our video is awesome and we really appreciate it. But if you can like our Facebook page, uh, it really helps our digital presence and our reach throughout the community of Northwest Arkansas. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, you can click the subscribe button and subscribe to our channel. Click the little church bell icon and that will notify you whenever the Vine of Northwest Arkansas um, uh, posts uh, something new, you'll get a little notification about that. I want to invite everybody who's watching to go to our online connect form. Uh, there's a link in uh, the description of this video. Go to thevinenwa.church slash online. Just some basic contact information to let us know that you're watching. Um, you can also click the green give button to give to uh, the vine. You can set up recurring giving if you would like to do that to support our mission and ministry in Centerton and the broader community. Um, you can also put down in the comments section if this is your first time uh, watching. That's a very important thing to do. If this is your first time watching, make sure to let us know in that comment box because at the Vine of Northwest Arkansas, we are all about generosity and we are all about supporting our community. And one of the things that we like to do is to make a donation in honor of all of our first time guests. And so if you are a first time joining with us, uh, make sure to let us know in that comment box because we what we want to do is to make a donation in your honor honor to our ministry partner for this week. And our ministry partner this week is the Northwest Arkansas Children's Shelter. So you can find a link uh, for that organization in our video description. So if you want to learn more about the Northwest Arkansas Children's Shelter, make sure that you click that link. Um, but if you also let us know that you're watching for the very first time, then we will make a donation in your honor to that local nonprofit. You'll also find a link for some reflection questions in the video description so you can click that. And those are just some really simple questions to help you dig a little bit deeper during your devotionals this week uh, into the content that we're gonna be talking about tonight. I think that's all I got as far as housekeeping stuff. Thank you once again for uh, joining with us this evening. So for now, let's grab a Bible, let's get comfortable, and let's explore the vast distance that Christ has come to be present with us. Do you remember what it was like when you first left home? Maybe you headed off to college or moved into your own place for the very first time, but no matter what your experience was, that first time that you set out on your own can be a terrifying moment. That moment that you step out of your comfort zone and the comfort and familiarity of your parents' house and you take your first big steps into that scary world full of potential and adventure. Now society says that you're an adult and that you should be able to just make it on your own. But I think if we're honest, we all had those voices that would creep up in the back of our heads, that would wake us up in the middle of the night and whisper things like, you're not ready for this. You'll never make it. This is too hard for you. I know I definitely wrestled with that fear in my own experience. I grew up in a very small town. I went to a very small high school in central Arkansas. The town was about 1,400 people, and I, I graduated in a class of 68, if I remember correctly. So when it came time to consider a college, I didn't necessarily want to go to some big state school that was going to have thousands or, God forbid, tens of thousands 
of students. The idea of that really scared me, to be honest. So I attended a small private school down in, southwest, uh, down in the southwest corner of Arkansas that had an enrollment of about 1,400 students, so right around the size of my own hometown. And I can remember uh, thinking, you know, I can manage this. Uh, th this is something that I could actually wrap my head around. It was still going to be a stretch, of course. It would definitely be a learning experience. But at least in my own mind, it was manageable. And I learned a... I learned a lot of great lessons out on my own, uh, but I remember one of the, the lessons that I learned early on was a lesson that I was definitely not expecting. I learned that leaving home is not only hard on children, it's also hard on parents. And the moment I learned that leaving home was hard for parents was the day that I walked in on someone else's mother folding my underwear. Okay, now let me explain. So this dorm that I lived in had this shared washer and dryer room and these washers and dryers had timers for about 40 to 50, 45 minutes. Um, I mean, that's about how long a load of laundry would take. And so, uh, of course, our classes were either 50 minutes or an hour and 15 minutes. So if you started a load of laundry on your way to class, there would be anywhere from a, a 10 to 30 minute wait between when the dryer cycle ended and when you could actually get back to your dorm and, and pick up your clothes. So one day I started a load of underwear and socks before class and as soon as class was over, I headed back to my room to get my laundry basket and then I headed down the hall to the laundry room, uh, which was a pretty standard procedure. Only this time when I walked into that room, what did I see but a woman who I had never seen before holding up one of my last pairs of underwear, folding it, and putting it on top of a pile of my freshly washed undergarments. And I remember walking in and the woman just looking at me and I must have had this, this confused, horrified look on my face because after a brief pause, she says, oh, don't worry, honey, I'm Keith's mom. As if that was supposed to make me feel better in some way. And it was then that I realized that Keith's mom had been coming to the dorm laundry room once a week to do Keith's laundry for him. And in Keith's defense, I want to be very clear about this, okay? It wasn't because Keith asked her to do it. In fact, according to Keith, he had been pleading with his mother for weeks to stop. And it was at that moment that I realized, oh, leaving home is just as much about the parents as it is about the children. You know, when the Apostle Paul describes the incarnation, when he, when he describes what it was like for Jesus to enter into creation as a human being, it sounds an awful lot like a leaving home story. In the second chapter of his letter to the church in Philippi, Paul says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, this passage of scripture is a very important passage. Uh, I mean, of course, it's, it's all Scripture, and all Scripture is important, but this passage is unique. You see, this passage is often referred to as the Christ hymn, and many scholars believe that the verses of this passage in Philippians 2 are actually lyrics to a hymn that was sung on a regular basis in many of the house churches in Philippi and some of the other surrounding areas. So what Paul is doing here is he's actually quoting the lyrics from a popular song of some of the earliest believers in the Christian church. And what does this song talk about? What's the subject of this hymn? Well, notice what it says. It's about how Jesus left his home in heaven and came down to earth and took on the fullness of humanity. 
And not just the clean and comfortable part of humanity, but the lowest form of existence that you can have as a human, as a slave. And the song says that though he was equal with God, he didn't try to hold on to that status for himself. No, he emptied himself. He gave it all up. He left all of the comfort and familiarity of his father's house. And he entered into all of the dirt and danger of creation. And he experienced the very worst that humanity could offer, even experiencing death itself on the cross. And why does he do this? Well, the hymn tells us that from this lowest of lows, God exalts Jesus to the highest place. He is brought down so that he might be lifted up. And we might even say more specifically that he was brought down to us so that we might be lifted up with him. You know, there was a saint who lived in the fourth century named Athanasius. And Athanasius wrote uh, one of the most treasured works in all of Christian history about the Incarnation. And this really popular work is a book called On the Incarnation. Um, it's not a, very, not a very creative title, admittedly. Uh, people back then seemed to be very straightforward with their titles. Um, I mean, he could have named it something like, Whoa, where'd this baby come from? But, but he didn't, okay? He named it On the Incarnation. Anyway, so in this book, he writes... In the incarnation of Jesus Christ, God became like man so that man might become like God. God became like man so that man might become like God. Now, that's a profound quote, isn't it? I love that quote. I really do. But I, I think in some ways it actually betrays how drastic of an idea the incarnation is. God became like man. It almost sounds mechanical, doesn't it? It makes the incarnation sound um, kind of simple and immediate, like Jesus is merely descending a few rungs down a ladder. But we must remember that the incarnation of our Lord was not simple at all. It was no simple task. In fact, the humble Christ child resting in a lowly manger in Bethlehem, that actually reveals to us the great distance that God is willing to go in order to save his people. You know, I remember around this time last year, I was traveling with my family down to central Arkansas uh, for Christmas and as I was driving one night down this long stretch of road in the backwoods of Perry County, I, I found myself looking up at the stars. And it was, it was unavoidable, really. I mean, there are hardly any lights out there at all anyway. And it was just my headlights uh, down in front of me and then the stars above. And I began to think about how each one of those little specks of light represented some distant celestial body light years away. And in that moment, I immediately uh, was overwhelmed with my own insignificance. I immediately felt small, which admittedly isn't something easy for me to feel. I mean, I want you to think about this. You are one person out of 7 billion people on one planet out of 8 planets, orbiting one star out of 300 billion stars in one galaxy out of an estimated 2 trillion galaxies. I mean, do you feel small yet? You know, as, as I looked up at the, the night sky, I actually got a little curious. I got, I got a little curious about how far away from Earth the farthest star is that we've discovered. Well, that honor goes to a star named Icarus. And Icarus was discovered by the Hubble telescope in 2016 after some gravitational lensing from a galactic cluster magnified an area in the sky by 2,000%. At least that's what Wikipedia says. And Icarus is estimated to be 14.4 billion light years away from Earth. And scientists estimate that the light that we, we actually see from Icarus was emitted when our universe was only 30% of its current age. That means that the light that hit the, sci the scientists' eyeballs, the, the light that they saw from Icarus in 2016, was 9.34 billion years old. Now, why do I tell you all this? Well, because I want you to think about it. If the light of some random star within creation has to go 14.4 billion light years just to reach our eyeballs, can you imagine how far that the Lord of all creation had to go just to become one of us? 
Can you imagine the implications that that idea has for the way that we serve our neighbors? I mean, when you think about the great distance that Jesus had to travel to enter into creation, all of a sudden, when Jesus tells you to go the extra mile for your neighbor, it sounds a whole lot easier, doesn't it? When you, when you think about all that happened, just so that Jesus could be born in a manger in Bethlehem, All of a sudden, when he says, you know what, you guys should endure suffering, it doesn't sound all that difficult anymore, does it? You know, at first glance, this passage in Philippians 2 may may just seem to be spouting off all this theological truth about who Jesus is. But, But Paul is actually quoting this hymn for a very practical reason. And it's very important that we not overlook the very first verse of this passage. Because Paul begins the passage by saying, in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. In your relationships with one another. In other words, look at all that Christ has done for you. Look at the vast distance that has been traveled just for you. Look at all that Christ gave up in heaven to endure a human existence. And if Christ can do all of this for you, then surely you can go the extra mile for your neighbor. Surely you can hold your tongue when you're tempted to gossip. Surely you can, you can give a little more or, or judge a little less or endure a little longer. It's, it's, it's as if Jesus is saying to us, this is how far I've gone to be with you. Now how far will you go for your neighbor? I mean, when I think of all that Christ gave up to become one of us, when I think of the, the great distance that he had to travel to to enter into his own creation. You know who I really feel sorry for? I feel sorry for that innkeeper. You know the one I'm talking about? The the one who turned away the Holy Family because there was no room for them in his inn. You know, I'm sure in that moment, that innkeeper thought his life was going great. So Caesar had called the census, and all of a sudden, people from all over the Roman Empire uh, were, for, were forced to return uh, to their home, to their towns, basically. Uh, and they were all going to need a place to stay. So this innkeeper's business was, was booming, right? He was killing it. And, and I bet he thought, you know what, if I make a good impression with some of these visiting dignitaries, that I bet word is going to spread about my, my inn and how great it is. And I might even get a little bit of a, a bump in my business after this census thing is over. But we all know the story. Late one evening, a young family arrives at at his door. And I wonder if he had any idea that the king of the entire universe was right there in front of him in Mary's womb. I wonder if he had any idea how far this king had traveled to get to this very spot. And I wonder if he had known if he would have made room for Jesus. I wonder if he would have risked upsetting some of his other paying customers. I wonder if he would have risked losing his financial security. I wonder if he would have risked losing the possibility of a a reputation boost. After all, business was good. His building was full, and surely that was the most important thing for an innkeeper, right? Well, friends, I think we actually should learn a profound lesson from this innkeeper. Because it doesn't matter how full your building is if Jesus isn't there. It doesn't matter if your business is good, if your marriage is good, your life is good, your kids are good. None of it matters if Jesus isn't there. Jesus didn't come into this world to make us happy, friends. He came into this world to make us holy. Jesus didn't come into this world to make our lives good. He came into this world to make us like God. You know, we might like to think that we would have opened the door for Jesus. Oh yeah, of course we would. We would have, we would have made room in our lives. We would have dropped whatever it was that we were doing. We would have cleared our schedules of all those other important things. Friends, but let's not kid ourselves. We're, we're no better than the innkeeper. We wouldn't have done those things then because we have multiple opportunities to do those things now every single day. And what do we do? We still let Jesus walk right on by. So I wonder if you made room for Jesus in your life. Have you 
Have you found room? He's emptied himself completely and he's traveled this infinite distance just to be with you. So don't turn him away. Make room. If there isn't any room, make room. Receive him this day. Understand that in this humble manger, the infinite has become finite. The distant has become close. The great has become small and the vast has become minuscule. Friends, the overwhelming has become overlooked. So don't miss him. He's here. Invite him in because he's traveled an infinite distance just for you. Yes, you. So that you might know that you are loved. So that you might know that you are worth it. And so that you might know that you are never, ever, ever alone. Glory to God in the highest, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. May his peace reign over all the earth, and may his goodwill be upon all of his creation. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.